Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We're bringing the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and entertainment to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. My guest today is David Graziano, the founder of Art With Me. David, I am thrilled to have you. Thank you for bearing with the technical, uh, <laughs> getting everything together, and uh, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Pleasure meeting you here. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, so, the key piece that really stood out to me um, almost immediately when I was doing our background research, when we're doing our background research is you and my father have something very important in common. Two things. You both went to Pratt, right? <laughs> and yep. my dad is a wood sculptor and a stone sculptor who did furniture oh, pieces, cool. very just cool. like yourself. Very and cool. when I read that, I'm like, shit, I'm like, this conversation was meant to be because I don't think I've ever met somebody who went to Pratt that's and awesome. did furniture. Yeah. That's awesome. He, um, he did, uh, his style. Well, he studied stone, proper stone sculpture in Italy for a couple of, for a year, for a semester, for two semesters. But before that, um, his medium was butcher block wood. So he would, he would compress the wood together with these giant clamps, these vices, and then chisel the shit yeah. out of it. Yeah. So all of his yeah. furniture pieces are like human male arms like this, like carved out like bar stools and swings. And he has all these old photographs from like the late seventies, right before I was born. And, and he's got this big giant Afro. Did he, and he's got did he study overalls. industrial design? I don't know exactly at all the, all the, all the coursework that he studied, but I'm, I'm sure it was everything. And then he went on to teach New York city board of ed art for 30 years. So amazing. That was, amazing. That, was, uh, that was his journey. So I ask you, you know, where did that creative juices come from? Were you always creative as a kid? Yeah. I mean, I, I, my, both my parents were, really creative. My father also was uh, a master carpenter, um, you know, furniture builder. And my mother, and uh, you know, she works in the medical field, but she's also, but she's an incredible interior designer and really artistic. And we just, there's some lineage of, a, of, a, of artists in our family from music to sculpting to painting. So probably had some of the pre-wiring uh, from the, the DNA component. Did you did, did you always feel that you were destined to go down that path? Was it natural? No, Were there any other no, inklings I, of like, hey, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a, a businessman? No, I was uh, I was groomed to be a baseball player. Actually, uh, I had a, my baseball coach when I was in little league told my mom that if um you know if I wanted to pursue this sport, he thought that if I stuck to it and and worked hard, that I could go all the way. So. It was baseball, 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 baseball camp, baseball, everything. And, and uh, it wasn't until um, ninth grade that uh, I took a an art class with an art teacher, like an AP art class, where um, she, the art teacher had called my mom and left, uh, was, had a conversation with her saying that uh, she thought that I was one of the most versatile art students she had ever seen and that I should pursue a career in art. So then my mom, you know, with the, she was very, scholastic person so she really you know took to any time a school would recommend something so it was that push that really like started making well maybe i'll maybe yeah yeah maybe i'll look at what i can do with my art you know and and where'd you start was it was it sketches just drawing i, I was doing sketches you know i took a photo when i was six years old of me standing next to a lincoln log structure that i had built that was basically six feet tall wow with cantilevered bedrooms and like yeah, it was architect, and I later in life I was like, "Mom, look at this structure. I'm six at years six. old. I'm standing next to this thing. Did, did, did this wasn't a sign a little bit that maybe I'd have something to do with the, with the building? But I did do a lot of drawing and entered into a lot of drawing classes when I was younger. But it wasn't until that teacher that really nudged my mom that it Someone was to like believe a in more him. serious career path, right? Yeah. I, I love it. It's so crazy too. Lincoln Logs. For anyone out there who doesn't understand what Lincoln Logs are, now they're plastic because my, my four year old son has Lincoln Logs. We got them for him. But but back when we had them, Dave, Dave, David, do you prefer Dave, David? It's, uh, Dave is fine. Um, they were wood. They were logs. They were literally Lincoln Logs. And for you to create something six feet tall with cantilever hanging over, that yeah. that's a modern marvel at that age. I had like five sets too. You know, I had so many pieces. <laughs> You can still buy them in wood. You just got to look, you got to hunt for them. 
My 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 vice is uh, and still is today's Legos. Um, if I if I tilted the camera around here, you could see on the top. I have all my adult Lego sets up there that I oh, that I build. Yeah, uh, that's the first time I've turned yeah. it on camera on the podcast. Look oh, at that. Nice, um, nice. So that, so that's that's my my fix there. So so fast forward. Nineteen, you're making furniture sculptures for some pretty pretty famous folks in 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 New York and and around the world. How, how did how did you get your art noticed? No, actually, it was I was in um, Orlando. Uh, where I was started a furniture custom furniture design business in my uh, late teens, early twenties, and I did a trade show, um, you know, uh, furniture trade show where I had a, a booth, and a runner up in uh, to best in show. I lost to Disney, um, mm. but uh, that that show, what happened was I got exposed to a couple of key interior designers for celebrities. And, um, after that I got asked to do, I did some furniture for like, um, Penn uh, Ken Griffey Jr.'s house. And then I, I did, uh, the conference table for the PGA headquarters in uh, Daytona. And I started, I just started getting my furniture into a couple of the right interior designers. And that got me some, uh, some great clients. And that was kind of the starting point for me getting my artwork out there. So let's think about those early days. And then, you know, I definitely want to get into the, the New York City, you know, club era of the late 90s and, and early 2000s there. But, you know, during mm -hmm. those times when you were starting out and really your, your first business, your, your furniture business, what was one of those early lessons that you learned when you look back on it today? And we'll get to Art With Me and, every, and all the success and what you built out in Tulum. One of those early lessons that was really a foundation for your current success. You know. I'm sure it's, it's it's different for a lot of people, but for me, what was I worked really well when I wasn't being told what I wanted to do, and the motivation of when you do something willingly, right? Being rather than hey, you know, you need to do this, and I'm going to go do this because you t asked me to do it or you told me to do it. It's different when I realize that you know I'm doing something with my own will, like I'm really willing, and when, and when you're put that when you're willing to do something. I think it really brings the best out of you. And uh, so early on, I think it was just realizing that, hey, I'm doing this for myself, you know, and I got to prove to myself, not because, you know, I've been asked to do this or my parents asked me to do this. It was the first time I realized that, you know, no, this is, this is something I really want to do for me. And I got to prove to myself I can do this. So a combination of following your passion and really following your heart and doing what you wanted to do really laid the groundwork there. So hitting the rewind button for a second, I want to go back to that time in, in New York City nightlife. Um, were, you, were you drawn to that scene? What was it? Was it the music, the vibe, or was it, it work? It, it, let like me, let me, I'll put it in the context. It, it actually happened before New York, but you need this component for the New York component. It's basically, I had an art gallery at 24 years old. All my furniture was in it in the front. And then I had a back part of the gallery, which I would like to help promote other artists. I saw the struggling artist um, that had so much talent, but, you know, was struggling on the business side of things. And I, I was lucky enough to have got a, a decent balance, enough to where I could take my art and have enough of a business sense to, to get it out there and make it marketable. So um, I used to do these art openings. And uh, I had a huge art opening and two guys came into the art opening that ran the nightlife in Orlando. And they looked at the clientele inside the gallery and they're like, where did all these people come from? These are beautiful people. We'd love to have these people in our nightclub. And I was like, they're like, how can we get these people in our nightclub? And I was like, well, I knew who they were. I was like, well, you can build a nightclub with me and I'll bring these people. <laughs> and it, it, it was through design really i was so i designed my first nightclub in orlando and i i became a partner with him it was called blue room so by the time i got to new york in my late 20s i was i had already owned the most successful nightclub during that time in orlando and designed and built it so it was uh, a logical place for me you know to get involved as i already had done it in orlando i i, I see these early components coming together being a connector being an artist having the business acumen and being in the music space. That's all kind of leading to us today. But I want to get to your first time going to Mexico. Do you remember your first trip to Mexico and specifically the, the Tulum region? That's yes. I do very clear. Very, very clear. And what was that for that first experience? 
Um, I had been to Mexico once or twice earlier on like a senior cruise in high school where we just stopped in Cancun. But uh, we were in Las Vegas um, for Memorial Day weekend with a friend of mine. And he was like, I got to go look at this piece of land in Tulum. Let's go. And I was like, uh, Harlan, I'm not getting on a plane and leaving Las Vegas on Memorial Day weekend to go to some town I've never heard of in Mexico. I'm sorry. Not interested. Um, anyways, he, I had a house who had liked a girl that was at a, a beauty pageant there. And he managed to go behind and speak to the girls and say, well, listen, I got the girls coming on this trip. Would you like to go on this trip? Uh, and I had had, I had an interest in this one beautiful woman. So he got me to go and to look at a piece of land. And we went to Tulum and I remember climbing over some rocks to get to the beach because we couldn't get to the beach and landing uh, my feet in that sand and had never really felt sand like that before. And I just looked at him and I, I said, Harlan, if you don't buy this beach, you're crazy. You know, and that was my first taste. And every year after that, every time I had a girlfriend that I really liked, I would bring her to this one spot that I thought was just paradise. So let's, let's talk about Tulum and the evolution of Tulum in, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the early 2000s and, and where it was from a, um, how much of it was built out, the infrastructure, the tourism industry, how, how open the locals were to having the tourism in there. And what were those early, early challenges of, of developing? Uh, well, the challenges were great, but the, the experience was always so wonderful that I was prepared to pretty much ride through any challenge that crossed my path. But, you know, uh, it was a very simple, what I loved about it was the simplicity. And so being there gave you a sense of just, you know, there weren't a lot of rules. There's not a lot of structure there, you know, he's like, so you'd be able to go down there and feel very free. And I think that's what I was attracted to is that sense of freedom where it's just like, I know that I'm only an hour and a half away from an international airport and I can, get, you know, but I feel so removed from the rest of uh, the modern day society that I could be anywhere in the world right now. I could be in, Fiji or Indonesia, but I'm actually just an hour and away from a major international airport. And it was, it was something I found really interesting. Yeah. And, and how much of the ethos of, of Burning Man, um, particularly the, the, the judgment free and the, the, the freedom and also the, the democratization of being like, you could be with, you know, billionaire founders and then, you know, you know, low budget pack, put, putting it all together. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a very, very important topic you just touched on because I felt the same energy on that playa as I did on the playa at Burning Man. And what I meant by it was just you had this magic of beauty where nature was just so captivating. So, you know, that was the first thing that takes you in, you know, it's like you go to Burning Man, you see these sunrises, these sunsets, and you just the nature in itself before a festival even happens there is so magnetic that you want to go there anyways, right? So I felt Tulum had this magic. And uh, it was so, the, the nature itself was so inspiring that I was like, wow, if, if I build something here, then people are going to flip out. This is, this has that, that magnetic magic. And it's, it's one of nature's, you know, beautiful spots in the world. It felt very, the energy felt very similar to Burning Man. Um, how do you balance keeping that ethos and mentality, David, with the business aspect, you need to build a property. You need to have it have, you know, elements of luxury to attract people there, but also keep it, you know, accessible to a point. How much of a challenge was that? Uh, I would say that at that point, what I was focusing on was what the new luxury was, and that's nature. I mean, nature is the new luxury, right? So, um, you know, I, I didn't want to, we were, we were going to build something that was luxury, but not the way that old people knew of luxury, right? And so the, the designing spaces where we integrated the nature into the rooms, all the, all, the, all the materials and elements that we built these hotels with came with within the region. And we, we really focused on how to harmonize the design with the nature so that in the end, the, the architectural and design component was less of, of what the, the, the focus was and more of the emphasis on how do we, you know, people let people enjoy the nature. And, and that's what it is, right? The aha mentality is, as you said, nature is, is the new luxury and especially your luxury. commitment to, to environmental conscious living. 
and how that's reflected at every single turn through the properties um, and, and, and getting that, you know, Green Key International Certification says, for anybody out there who's not familiar, how important is it and how difficult is it to get that status? Oh, I mean, Green Key, it's kind of like lead certification for architecture. You know, it's, it's, it's right. a category. It's a category. It's a category in hospitality uh, that really shows that your business is taking a, a certain amount of environmental responsibility in order to, uh, you know, to be awarded that. I think for me, it just comes from just being grateful because the nature gives us so much, and there's there, it's so it's so beautiful that. There's, there's got to be a way or a better way to continuously work in harmony with it so that you can accomplish your goals as a businessman while being really grateful and appreciative and respectful to the environment that's helping you do that. <laughs> I mean, shouldn't that just be the way, right? I mean, it between be you and I, like, it, like it seems so simple and I think just greed gets in the way. And, just, yeah, I think it, and, and lack of awareness. I think it's lack of awareness. And true. Lack of appreciation. So let's get into the Art With Me origin story. Correct me if I'm wrong. In 2017, you began uniting the Tulum Hotels and the community. Was there, was it like an idea that's been building within you, you know, putting all the pieces together of your life up until this point, the culmination of creativity, music, community? How did it all start, man? Art, art, art With Me is, is everything that I'm passionate about and good at wrapped in one. It's, it's the, it's like my, if I was, it's, you know, I want to leave a legacy in in the history of imagination. This is where, uh, this is, this is where my attempt is going to go. I, I, it was a combination of, you know, where I was in my life as, a, as an adult and the different developmental stages you go through as an adult. You know, I was leaving the stage of like, I want to build a family. I already, got, I had already had gone through like, oh, you know, the physical part of my life where I'm an athlete, I wanted to, you know, it was, a lot of external, and then there was this element where I, I need to build a career, prove myself to myself, you know. And then and I went and I, I got to start a family, and there was this family part of my development, right? And I need, and then once I got through those three stages, I got into this uh, area of like, how can I be more in service? How can I give back, right? And I've been with all the gifts that uh, that I've been blessed with, so I I wanted to use uh, creativity and imagination as the key lens, you know, uh, to achieve some of the, uh, the goals, which was, you know, how do we, in Tulum, originally the idea wasn't a, a, a universal or, or a global brand concept. It was like, okay, we got issues in Tulum. It's growing really fast. There's environmental challenges. If I'm going to be here with my businesses, I got to say one first thank you to Tulum and thank you to Mexico for all the, all the wonderful, beautiful things that it's helped. And then all these other hotels, we just been taking and taking and taking from Tulum because it's and so we need to come together and we got to figure out a way to give back. And so I would like to use art as the lens to showcase these things um, because art's inspiring. And when people are inspired, um, they're more in a receiving mode. So absolutely, it's like when you when you crack somebody open and you're going to share information with them, the moments that are best are during moments of inspiration. It's where it resonates deeper. And I noticed that with my own retreats when I was doing that in Tulum. The difference from day one when they first arrive to day two or three once they've been really inspired up. by the nature, right? So Art With Me's principal goal was how do we tap into that energy, right? When somebody is cracked open uh, through inspiration. And so can we create inspirational moments and habitats and, and, and a platform where these moments are more likely to happen and then we can get into sharing really important topics and discussing things that are imminent in today's world. Essentially, you're creating a canvas for self-discovery. Absolutely. Self-discovery, it's growth, you know, the growth component is there. It's, um, it's, you know, deeper connections, human connections with people. I mean, the happiest people I know are the people that have the healthiest and strongest relationships with their friends, their loved ones, and their coworkers. Right? Amen. And so I think, we are a social species and, you know, um, being a social species, we thrive off social interaction. So if I can participate in creating spaces or platforms where people have the opportunity to have deeper 
human connection through celebration and inspiration, um, this is the space I want to be in. What well, was one of those early challenges from a, from a business perspective, you know, putting together a, I mean, I don't know if the original vision was, was a festival rather a get than a gathering, which your, which your original thought process was, but it, it morphed into uh, a festival. What were some of those early challenges? Well, <laughs> the, in, in, to, uh, doing anything in Mexico is a challenge in sense of getting it done. Uh, Government, think, politics, you know, there, there, police. Yeah, there's <laughs> logistical challenges. There's obviously, you know, I had, luckily because of the hotels, I had a good baseline platform to start. You had from. headquarters. I had headquarters, but um, I, I had things like, for example, we had um, brought in a free, the one of Mexico's biggest bands called Bronco, which they're huge. And we, we basically were going to take a quarter of a million dollars and donate it to the city by throwing a free concert in the city. We did not want Art With Me to be a tourist event only. We wanted it to be an event that was good for the city. So 30% of our programming was free. And so we would, we would, we'd, we had a free concert in the, in the, for, in the municipality, the town for all the locals. And we drove up and down the street the week before with megaphones on a car and said that we had Bronco coming to Tulum and it was free. And the way that you got your ticket was to bring a minimum of 15 recycled bottles to our recycle stations. And so we collected 4,000 pounds of plastic, 7,000 people lined up over the week with bags of plastic. We threw this concert. So the city was giving us this kind of fairgrounds area where they have near the municipality and they were going to give it to us for free and supply the ambulances and police. Four days before the event, or three days before the event, my produ production guy goes down there, calls me up, freaking out, saying, uh, David, you're not going to believe this. There's a carnival on this property right now. There's a fair <laughs> Right now. What? Right now. Right now. <laughs> it's like you have, we're supposed to be setting up a stage, and you have a full-fledged carnival going on. In this Shit. Field. So um, that was a unique challenge. The, the city double booked. They didn't ever pay attention to who was uh, already previously booked there. And this... The, the carnival operators did not want to move. And we had a 10,000 person concert that it was going to happen in three days. It's a stalemate. So I won't get, I won't get into the details, but it, it, that was a, it's a literally a Mexican a, standoff. It's a Mexican standoff. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it was resolved one way or another. We resolved it. It was amazing. 10,000 people showed up to this concert. All the government officials were there. It was it lit up to them. It was really beautiful. So after after the dust settles after that first festival, how soon was it? Was it was it immediate? Where you're like, shit, we we got to keep this going. We got to take it to the next level. We got to do this again next year. We got to keep it going. We got to create more. We have so many ideas and learnings. Um, well, I had a couple of friends come up to me after the event. That first event, I think only 450 people. I, I basically invited personally went out and invited you know a bunch of friends and. Well, I'd say five or six key people in my life came up to me afterwards independently. Not, you know, it was like, this is, oh my God, what you just did is incredible. You've got to, you got to expand on this idea. You know, they're like, this is going to be much bigger than anything you've done before in your life if you, if you go down this path. And they were inspiring me by their excitement um, and what they saw and how much the event inspired them. And then, you know, I thought to myself, it was the first time where I was really working on something that was bigger than my own stuff, you know, and I think that was inspirational where it was connected to something bigger than my own business. And that was the, the component where the charity component, you know, and the aspect of like, how can we give back to by still having fun? You know, we could do all this with an intention and still have a good time. You know? Yeah. So when we sat down and we saw how these pillars like started to really work where it was the, the component of with me, I, I mean, I tried to, trademark with me, but that, that wasn't possible. But I love the idea of the with me component. It's like all of a sudden you had eat with me and you had play with me and you had, you know, dance with me and breathe with me. And all of a we wow. saw these pillars, right? And we're like, wow, each one of these pillars are their own world. You know, eat with me is going to be a food and wine event or, or a, a nightly pop-up or a weekend food and wine festival. Breathe with me is a wellness event. Dance with me is a, a one night pop-up or it's a weekend music festival. And then all of a sudden, and then we have the, uh, our care with me, our foundation, you know, all these pillars are really their own thing and they all can come together maybe three or four times a year for the full programming. We really love that idea, how we can expand 
and reach out with the concept and the brand without always having to produce a large scale festival. And that's a key. Um, it's it's it was it was inspiring to, to realize that we had this great um, kind of idea to really market well. And it, and it all comes together. I mean, um, I mean, I, I've taken a look at the lineups over the last couple of years from from the artists, the musical artists, the physical artists, the installations, the health and wellness that you're that you're referencing, and it's incredible to see all these really uh, eclectic group of creators coming together under one space and the curation of that too. Talk to us a little bit about the curation. Um, what goes into bringing the right people, the right groups, the right organizations together. And how difficult is that? Or does it happen organically because you're attracting and these are the people in your ethos and your circles? Well, I mean, a little bit of both. Ideally, I'd like to be it like it to be a combination, you know, and uh, I think the uh, the future of the of the events portion of Art With Me, because Art With Me is not just an events it's our festival. It has a sculpture park aspect which I'd like to share with you later as an agency component where we, we, we want to help the artists get their exposure and sell their art. But uh, I think, you know, for me, the event's about being well balanced and it's the idea of the pillars or to have, you know, a better understanding of what is a balanced lifestyle through, you know, the acts of celebration and fun. And, um, you know, I think what happened is, is we just really tried to make it eclectic in a way that it was first trying to make it so that we weren't just one genre. We weren't just going to be like, oh, we're going to be this type of music. You know, we're gonna, no, we're going to have, I have everything from folk singing, singer, songwriter to electronic to reggae. To, and everything in between. We wanna, if our age demographic is from two to 80, then, you know, our music and our art and everything else has to, you know, reach, you know, a very diverse group of people. This is a challenge it's a it's 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 a benefit and it's also a challenge you know how do you tell your story if you're spread so wide you know so we we've, we've been we've been working on that but i think the the future of it wants to be a combination of the art with me's creative team sitting down and helping to select and produce this this experience and then having a whole set section that's more like burning man that allows participants and the ticket holders to come in and combine their own addition by putting their creativity and their ideas into place. So the future, what we're looking to do is to create on a large scale festival is you'd have two main districts. You'd have a district that was uh, a festival being produced and you'd have a whole district that was a component where the camping aspect would be, you know, made up of, you know, camps that were also adding their content and creating their own stuff. And you have both worlds kind of working together. I love I love the collaboration. I mean, that is a consistent theme here: creativity and collaboration. So, what was the impetus to take the to take the concept to Miami, and why Miami? Uh, um, one, I'm from. I mean, I grew up in South Florida, so I probably have some connection to that region just based on that's where my childhood was. Um, but I I also thought from. You know, from the company's perspective on the brand, there's uh, there's three types of events on the festival side. We have a micro event, we have a mid-size event, and we have a large festival. Miami, we, I thought, was a great destination to do a mid-size event, about 15,000 people, um, that would be really good for the brand awareness. So the Tulum and Miami's um, were really – the idea was this, these two locations are very international. They draw a lot of international attention. Um, there's a lot of creativity going on in both those destinations. There's a lot of press that circles around it, a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought from a strategic point that that was a good move for the brand. Second, we also love we love the destination, um, the weather, the beach. It also felt you know similar to where it was the, the art when we was born, and it's a great it's a great location. It's a hub. So, you know, getting artists and, 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 and materials and things was very accessible. And so overall, we thought our next step was to do art with me in an area that would, you know, be in the, have the right environment, the weather, you know, uh, hopefully it doesn't rain this year, but it, it, it's generally sunny. Um, but it also, it's just that beach vibe that we started on. So it was kind of close to our roots in terms of the environment. 
And it also, I mean, tell me if this has anything to do with it, you know, on the calendar, it aligns, it's right before Art Basel. There's a lot of um, creative folks in town and logistically it's like, Hey, I mean, even for myself coming, it's like, Hey, you're already going to be coming into town and you know, bump the calendar yeah. up a few days. So one, once we decided Miami, it's a very important point. Once we decided Miami and we started honing on what, what date would be best, right? We, we realized that that weekend would allow artists to be able to leave their art during the fest, during the Art Basel, which was to us, you know, we're at heart an art festival, right? So if artists are going to have the opportunity to leave their art or have their art present during this incredible major international event, one of the biggest in the world, that this, was a, this, this is a good move for, for the main component, which is the art component. Uh, we had a lot of people tell us it was a terrible weekend. You know, it's it's a Thanksgiving. Oh, which is, true. Some people, some people, some people, uh, you know, are against you know going up against a giant. But I, we look at. I don't look at things like that. I don't look at it like um, we're slicing up a pie with more slices. I look at it like, well, we're just going to make another pie. You know, and, abundance, abundance, yeah. David. So there's enough, there's enough for all, and I thought that ultimately the smart strategy was what do, what can we do that's best for the artist? And that, and that, and that's a, a tremendous um, uh, approach there. So what what's what's I'd like a to say one other thing. I, I, it might sure, take us a it. little longer than it might take us an extra year or two because it is a challenging time of the year. So we knew that this this date might mean that maybe it takes a you know an extra year or two to get. The, the thing really rolling, but you know, we were prepared to do that because we knew that that was the, the right weekend for the event and, and the people participating in it. Well, hopefully that's the right strategy. And I think it's going to work out just fine for you guys. What's a philanthropic, what's a give back element to the city and people of Miami? Um, so we're focusing the care with me component. It's very moldable. Usually we would go into cities and we're working with the government. We'd ask them, well, what, what, what areas do you want us to focus on? How can we, you know, bring something uh, to light that is important to you, the citizens of Miami? That's one question we, we usually ask. But really where we've gone is we've just realized that we really want to focus on how to bring more creativity, more art, more imagination to kids, especially underprivileged kids that would not normally have the ability to experience this type of art or interact with it or even be in the presence of it. So um, like last year, we, 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 we brought in a bunch of schools and kids and we created this whole like daytime experience for the kids where it's free. Um, kids are free under 12 years old. So we, we really have a day programming set up where there's you know art and, and wellness stuff for the kids. And so this year um, we're uh, building, uh, we're out to build these backpacks where we'll donate it to underprivileged kids that have a backpack, but it's full of art supplies. And it's got like right. drawing pads and color pencils and stuff like that. And so I think we're really going to, even though we're the environmental aspect is we, we like to create awareness campaigns. We're going to bring attention to the, to different environmental initiatives, but I really we're really focusing on how do we bring more art, creativity, and imagination to underprivileged kids. Inspiring the youth. And that brings me to the question yeah. as we as we bring it home here, David. Um, when I say the word legacy, you know, when your time comes to leave the earth, how do you want to be remembered? <laughs> um, you know, I, it's just very, I've always just envisioned that as my life goal. Um, and it's basically, when my friends and family and loved ones or people that know of me are uh, reflecting on my death or standing at my gravesite, um, that feeling that I want to leave them with, you know, that feeling is, is both my life goal. And there's a fe sense of feeling you have when someone passes, you know? And I think for me, it was like, if I could inspire somebody in their lifetime, to be a better person, to be more creative, to, you know, to, to dig deeper into who they are. If I had any involvement at all in that part of someone's life, that would be probably the greatest gift I could give. That's massive. And you've had such an, an interesting, eclectic, fascinating, um, privilege in a, in a, in, in, in a positive way, life. And you've experienced so much, David, what's the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received in your journey? 
that you take action on every single day? Well, I was, um, I had met, uh, I had met somebody when I was 20 and, uh, they were twice my age. We played a racquetball game and I didn't do that well, but I was inspired by him because he was just, I was a better athlete. He just outsmarted me and, uh, I started to hang out with him and I actually went into the bathroom and I was sitting on the toilet and he had a nice picture frame that you could not. You know, so you want somebody to read something, hang it on the wall in front of the toilet. <laughs> and uh, it said 10 things I have learned. And the first quote was, I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And I knew what that meant. Anybody could read that. And I said to myself, I understand that. But I want to know what that means. I want to feel what that means to live that. Right. And so it's the difference of reading something and being like, I get that. And the difference of like really knowing what it feels like to live that way for me was two different things. So I spent probably the next 10 years of my life in the bookstore reading and downloading and doing everything I can to understand what that quote really meant. I love it. And David, this has been a great conversation. Um, I ask every guest this question because I really believe in your why and your how that drives you forward. So when you look back on your life so far and you think about those times when you really had to dig down deep and harness that inner tenacity to pull forward, to make something happen, to overcome personal, professional uh, difficulties. And in the same breath, when you sit here with gratitude, appreciation, what you and the team have built and this legacy that you're creating, what keeps you centered? What keeps you focused? David Graziano, what is your North Star in life? (laughs) You know, actually, it's really simple. And it's probably been said in many different forms. I think, uh, you know, everybody's wanting to, I think, achieve the same thing, just different ways of naming it or, or, or calling it. But I realized for me, the fundamental in my darkest moments that really pulled me out of everything that changed my life, my life is is my attitude, and that every decision I make in my life is connected to my attitude. And when I realize that, I realize that you know how how every outcome of every situation is really dictated by my approach. And so the, when I approach things, and I look at my attitude on how I am, you know, these things really changed the outcome of many situations for the better. And I think if people just realize that, you know, it's not, it, it, we're not, we're not just driving this vehicle through life without our hands on the steering wheel. We actually can put our hands on the steering wheel and we, we can have a lot to do with the outcome of the things that we're approaching in life a lot more than we think. And I think changing my attitude changed my life. I think that was a fundamental key thing. And, you know, I, I have, there's another great speaker that I listened to. He, he summed it up really interesting. He, he said that the word responsibility, you know, isn't just how well you take care of your chores. He's like, listen to the word, right? It's respond ability. It's your ability to respond to things, right? So and the better you are at responding to life's happenings, the more joy you're going to have in your life. And so those are the simple lessons that I practice every day because I can't control everything that's happening to me on my outside world but I can choose how to handle it. And that is my choice. And those things are the skill sets that I really worked on my, also my adult life. I love it. This is tremendous. And David, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Hang with me one moment here. Uh, everybody, if you're interested and you are planning to, or maybe you're listening to this show and you're like, Hey, I could get down to Miami on November 26th and 27th down to Miami for art with me. You could check out more at miami.artwithme.org. Tickets are on sale now. Um, I think this is going to be a pretty special weekend, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I believe so. My experience tells me yes. Um, it's just one of those experiences that you have to be there to fully understand it. David, thank you so much for joining me. Where else could folks connect with you? Where could they learn more? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot going on on the Instagram. Uh, uh, how uh, You know, Art With Me Life. And um, we're going to be pumping out. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of great content coming out before the event. So that's one way. Our, all our social on Facebook, Twitter, our social media platforms 
really have some great content if anybody's interested in learning more about the event. Awesome. Good stuff. I'm going to link everyone up in the show notes. Listen, everyone listening, thank you for spending time with David and I. We certainly appreciate and know how valuable your time is. Please check out Art With Me. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com. Remember, take care of each other, look out for one another, and catch us next week for another great episode of The Podcast. Take care, everybody.